Stories can hurt. Stories can help. There is fact and fiction. Then there's the stories we tell. On the 17th of March 1954, 18-year-old Susan Mary Oyston left her family home in Windsor at 8.20am and made her journey to work at the National Bank, located in the heart of Melbourne. Susan arrived at 8.30am and took the lift up to the ninth floor, then made her way to the roof via the stairs. At 8.40am, two men on the other side of Collins Street saw an object in freefall. A tramway inspector heard the sound of it hitting the ground. It was Susan. Bones were broken and fractured all over her body. Several organs had been pierced and blood was spurting from her mouth. Moments later, she was dead. The coroner noted suspected suicide, but family, friends and work colleagues all protested to the happy, outgoing and loving person that she was. Susan had gone out with friends to the Princess Theatre the night before and seemed in good spirits. While Susan's body made its way to the city morgue, her bags had been packed and ready for the holiday she planned on taking. At the time, the roof of the National Bank had a four foot high wire safety fence. That supposedly ran around the perimeter. It was set back 10 feet from the edge of the building. When police went to the roof, they found Susan's coat neatly folded inside the fence. So the story seemed to be that. Susan, before her shift, had gone to the roof for some fresh air and perhaps to feel the warm kiss of the sun. She got too close to the edge and accidentally fell. And that's where the story ends. But then again, do stories ever really end? A cold case is created over time. When all leads and possibilities have been exhausted, perhaps the coldest case is when an event wasn't even considered a crime in the first place. 70 years ago, Elizabeth Maureen Williams was murdered on a beach in Albert Park. John Brian Kerr was arrested and after three trials was found guilty of the murder of Williams. Originally handed down the death penalty, he served 20 years. Many believed he was innocent. Shirley Mae Collins' semi-naked body was found on the driveway of a Mount Martha holiday house. She was viciously murdered. Her dead skin was so white that an earlier passerby thought he was looking at a store mannequin. Susan Mary Oyston accidentally fell to her fate from the top of the National Bank. The death of these three women were treated as different cases. Nobody could have even had a thought that all three events could be connected. Then, a man allegedly confessed to all three. Anthony Dowsley's news article for the Herald Sun made incredible revelations to the public about the possible existence of a serial killer that walked the streets of Melbourne in the late 40s and early 50s. It all started at a Camberwell cafe where a waitress befriended an older man, eventually becoming his carer. The man allegedly confessed to her that he had killed Williams and Collins, as well as pushing Susan Oyston to her death because Susan confronted him about those murders. The woman wrote them down and eventually handed them over to the police. Now, let's look at the information that points to the entity of the Johnny-come-lately killer existing. Number one, the victim profile. All the victims in the series between 1949 to 1954 were all young, white women aged between 14 and 20. However, Collins looked mature for her age and could have easily passed for older. Number two, location. The geographical pattern is there from central Melbourne. It continues south almost in a straight line. In the Williams and Collins cases, both were murdered and found close to beaches. Williams was on the shoreline of one. The outlier being Susan who was killed almost unplanned to cover the previous murders. Number three, the scene at the National Bank. In a suicide jump, the individual normally just steps off, meaning the point of impact with the ground should be reasonably close to the base of the building. This is also consistent with an accidental fall. Susan's body crashed to the ground past the curb, even clearing a parked car, approximately 12 feet from the curb. This distance is more consistent with the momentum of being pushed. The two men that saw Susan falling never saw her leave the roof, only in mid-flight. So potentially, 
Even if one of the men had looked up, they may have seen a figure standing atop. Susan's coat that was found on the roof was inside, not outside the safety fence, and was neatly folded. This was the coat that, of course, she was wearing when she arrived to work that day. This suggests that a light struggle could have taken place where Susan's coat came off. After the act of killing, the perpetrator may have experienced remorse and carefully folded and placed the coat down. This act has been seen in other murders, such as the Medill and Haywood murders based in Shepparton. The death of Susan Oyston was also the last killing in this series, so the Johnny Come Lately killer may have stopped out of remorse. If the Johnny Come Lately killer was indeed real, and was the man who allegedly confessed, there are an additional four points that can be added. Number one, the man worked at the National Bank at the time of Susan's death. Number two, Susan arrived to work 20 minutes early for no established reason. Maybe she planned to confront the man about the information she had. Number three, playing mine hunter, the psychological ramifications that came from the statement from the man's daughter. He was scared of women, he was shy. Number four, the most damning if true, the confession is said to contain only details that the man who committed the killings would know. In the end, by murder, accident or suicide, the result is the same. A young, beloved woman lost her life in a tragic manner. Besides one nine-story silent witness, Susan Mary Oyston's last fleeting moments on this earth will forever remain a mystery.